Welcome, everybody, to Gotham Go. Let's give a big round of applause to all the organizers. As usual, it's been very entertaining as well as informative. So I am Ron Evans, AKA Dead Program on the internet, on Twitter, GitHub, and all those other places, Bitbucket. And uh, I'm also Mark Bates' robot guy. That is true. I expected them to introduce me that way, so I was a little disappointed. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, he's, you know, he has a plumber and an electrician and a robot guy, and I'm that, <laughs> I, I am that guy. I also uh, run a boutique consultancy called The Hybrid Group that we specialize in writing software for hardware companies. So you might be guessing, if you guessed that this is not a talk about distributed systems, you're correct. It's a talk about embedded systems in Go. And so we've done a lot of work for clients such as Intel. Uh, thank you very much, Intel, for all of your sponsorship and also a company called Sphero out of Boulder, Colorado that did a robot that was very popular in some movies about wars in the stars. <clears throat> That's all I'm allowed to say, and I'm not joking. Anyway, moving on. So we've done a lot of work in open source and in Go. Uh, GoBot, a very popular project among the embedded Go set. Uh, did At the first Gotham Go, I was fortunate enough to give a presentation about that. But today I'm here to talk about a relatively new project called GoCV. So GoCV lets us use OpenCV. OpenCV is the most popular computer vision open source library slash framework. Uh, it's got like 27,000 stars on GitHub. It literally has hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, it literally has hundreds of computer vision algorithms. Many of them are patent free and some of them do require patent licensing. So, We've wanted to use it from our favorite programming language, Go. No, new logo, thank you. And, and the nice fuchsia as well. Um, so you can also use GoCV with the Intel Computer Vision SDK, which is basically OpenCV plus some additional work from Intel engineers to do hardware acceleration and some other stuff. So first of all, what is computer vision? Well, like all rhetorical questions, I will answer. Computer vision can detect motion for things like surveillance or security applications. Recognize people. That way, if you want to go to your health club and you don't want to ruin the silhouette of your beautiful workout clothes with a badge or a phone, that's impossible. Of course, you have to bring your phone. Telepresence uh, for various, uh, maybe on other planets. Uh, autonomous vehicles, planes, trains, automobiles, and of course, drones. And my personal favorite, augmented humans. So what I mean by augmented humans would be, for example, a radiologist who is able to use computer vision software to analyze your x-rays and determine that probably an MRI is needed in a particular area of interest. So why you should use Go for computer vision? Well, obviously the concurrency, the portability, and the performance. Same all reasons as you would use it for any other application. So how GoCV actually works. So GoCV is written in Go, and it calls CGO, which then calls some C wrappers that we wrote around the C++ classes that OpenCV is written in. That sounds kind of complicated. And uh, you're right, it took quite a while to get it right. But it means that just from completely normal idiomatic Go, you can do all of these wonderful things on Linux, on Mac OS, and on Windows. Yes, I said Windows. <laughs> um, at uh, Dot .go, which was a great conference in Paris um, last year, uh, Brian Kettleson gave the ending keynote and he was mentioning the statistic that I think 87% of user desktops are still running Windows like in the world, not in the hipster world, like in the wide world. So let's get right to some demos. Um, I'm gonna show live code here, so uh, I guess the only one so far, so call me crazy. Uh, so the hello world of video. Can you guys see this okay? So the whole world of video, um, I usually show the whole world in Go because I do this talk, um, or many talks for people who've never even seen Go. So of course we have package main. We import the GoCV package, which is where all of the GoCV wrappers live. And then our main function, first we open a video capture device, which means a webcam. In this case it's camera zero, which would be the first camera. We open a new window which is we need to be able to display what the camera is seeing, and then we create a new mat. I'll talk about what a mat is in a minute, but it's a place for us to put the image. And then we repeatedly read the webcam and put it into the image, 
show the image in the window, and then wait one millisecond to give a chance to hit keyboard commands if we want to try to control it. All right, so let us see the demo. So go run, demo, hello video. And there I am. Hello. Gratuitous applause. All right, so we're going to keep this program around because uh, we're going to need it later. All right, so into the matrix. I did not promise you bad puns, did I? OK, <laughs> double negatives. All right, so what is the mat? So a mat is a matrix of bytes. It's the fundamental data type that you use in GoCV and consequently in OpenCV. I might say OpenCV or GoCV kind of interchangeably um, during this talk. So your typical mat is a two-dimensional three-channel. So two dimensions, x and y, and then three channels for b, g, and r, blue, green, and red. So aren't you, wait, don't you mean red, green, and blue? Well, because OpenCV uh, is a very mature technology, it supports a lot of video formats that existed before RGB. I know you're going like, like whoa, there were things. So you can also have a two-dimensional one-channel mat, like a grayscale image. And then you can have a three-dimensional four-channel mat if we want to represent uh, arrays, vectors, point clouds, basically any type of complex information that's going to be produced by analyzing this video, especially if we're taking video and trying to turn it into a 3D space. So I'm going to show four small applications that use GoCV. And uh, the first one is face tracking. Well, wait a minute. You know, face tracking really isn't cool anymore. Right? Like, do we really want? I'll tell you what's actually cool. Face blurring. That's the new coolness, right? So, um, but we still need to be able to track the faces in order to blur them. So to do that, we're going to use something that's called a Haar cascade classifier. So Haar wavelets are a mathematical technique for taking and dividing any particular set of data into four different categories. It turns out that we can use this same mathematical technique to I take and identify an image as part of a, sm a smaller part of an image, like a face, that's part of a larger image, by basically doing the same operation in a more granular sense. In other words, if we don't find the correct Haar wavelet at a larger size image, then we're not going to find it in the smaller one either. Luckily, you don't got to worry about all that, because you could just call the GoCV cascade classifier. So let's take a quick look at some code. We're just going to run through. I'm going to skip over a lot because uh, time is short. So package main, we're going to bring in a few of our friends from the Go standard packages, and then Go CV. So check to make sure, bless you, check to make sure that you can, we have the right arguments. We parse them so that we can enter in the two things we need. One is which camera we're going to use. Oh, yeah, I should plug in the right camera. And then the other one is uh, the Har Cascade classifier file to use. There are different classifiers that have been trained to recognize different features, faces, eyes, dogs, cats, cars, whatever. Um, so same thing that we did before. We open the capture device so that we can pull stuff out of the video. This time we're going to actually close things when we're done like you're supposed to. We're going to open our new window and close it, prepare our image matrix, and then prepare our Cascade classifier to do the analysis and then load an XML file that is in the OpenCV format, which has been trained with the facial recognition data. So we'll start reading the camera. We read an image in, same as before. But this time now, we're going to take and we're going to call the classifier detect multiscale passing in that image. So detect multiscale does all of that, the operations using the Haar wavelets in order to determine whether or not there are any faces in this image. And if so, it returns them in a uh, slice of rectangles. So then we're going to go through, pull out just the region that's got your face, perform a Gaussian blur on it so that we can't see you, and then we'll close that face so that we can preserve memory. Because when you're in CGO, you must manage the memory yourself. Go is not going to do all the work for you. So you need to think things through a little bit. Luckily, we've thought about it all for you in the context specifically of OpenCV. So then we show the image, and we wait for a key to be pressed so that we can stop the code. So let's go, and let's run some code. So it's face blur. We're going to use camera one, and we're going to use this file. 
And so, you, it's kind of creepy. Let me focus it. Yeah, that's better. If, if your face is, yeah, basically it works perfectly on Mark. <laughs> Plausible deniability, man, I got you covered. So anyway, face blur. All right, so motion detection and tracking. So in order to do that, we're going to use something called background subtraction. There's actually quite a few different ways to do this. This is just the simplest. It is probably not the best. Uh, but we're going to use background subtraction that uses something called a mixture of Gaussians, or MOG. So a mixture of Gaussians, um, for everybody who was kind of snoozy in math and magical classes, Gaussian is a normal distribution, you know, like the bell curve. So we're going to analyze the uh, presence of different colors by using a mixture of Gaussian for the red, green, and blue. And then we're going to take that data and we're going to go through each of the different pixels that are in the image that we're going to consider and perform a running mixture of Gaussians. That way we're able to take and determine what is moving in the foreground and what is staying the same in the background. Or you could just use the GoCV background subtractor mod 2 class. <laughs> Struct. So uh, we'll go through this code a little bit quicker. But it's the same sort of pattern. It's pretty much always the same pattern with most computer vision applications. You open the camera. You open the window to show it in. In this case, we're going to need a few mats, one with the original image, one with the delta image, one with the image thresholds. And we're going to perform a threshold operation so that we can clean it up. So we open our new background subtractor, and now we're ready to work. Read an image in from the webcam. We're going to apply the MOG2 algorithm to the image and produce the image delta. Now, this is kind of important. You'll notice that we have the ampersand here. That means that we're going, we want the address of. We actually want the pointer to that. The reason why we're doing that is because it's very odd in Go that a thing you pass by value is suddenly changed as if it was by reference, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, the, when you pass something in, it should not be changed in the original caller, unless you want it to be. So we actually put this error specifically to indicate to the developer this thing can be changed by the function that you're calling. So then we perform the threshold operation to result in this image threshold. We do a little bit more cleanup using a dilate operation, basically getting rid of the extra noise. Then we call GoCV's find contours. Find contours is part of OpenCV that will hopefully find the rectangles of the part that's moving. Then we're going to draw that onto the image and then wait for a key to be pressed. So uh, let's see the demo. First of all, though, um, so that's going to be this one down here. Let's plug in that camera. I have many cameras. I have many more cameras at home, but, but these are the ones that fit into my backpack. All right. so. We're going to call motion, the main, and uh, I think I can just put in the camera ID. But you know, we're going to need something to move. This is, this is going to be moving in here. Well, I brought a, a, a toy robot with me because uh, I like that. So this is a Sphero Spark Plus, which is one of the uh, transparent ones that they have. So let's see. It has to run under sudo because it needs access to the Bluetooth Lower Energy Adapter. OK. It's not really moving that much. That's moving enough. It's carpet. It's all right. It'll kind of quiver. All right, so let's go back to running this. All right, so here we see it's detecting some motion. inside that area. So here, the, it's doing the background subtraction. It's analyzing the area of motion. So like if I stick my foot in, you'll, you'll see it kind of pop out there when it's in a different rectangle. It's the first time I've used my foot in the demo, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, so motion detection using GoCV. You could totally applaud after each demo, kind of like a magician. Like, if I don't saw myself in half, then everything's fine. All right. MJPEG streaming. So basically, everything is better when it's streamed over the internet. 
as everybody knows who's ever gone on Twitch or any of the other cool stuff. But the problem is, how do you actually get it onto the internet in the first place? Well, that's what the motion JPEG or MJPEG format is uh, typically used for. So uh, people do all these crazy hacks to use uh, FF MPEG and FF Player to do this streaming. But I thought, wouldn't it be better if we could do it in the pure Go solution? So uh, we're basically going to use the MJPEG package, which is another package uh, we forked. I can't remember the original guy's name, but he disappeared and is unresponsive. So I guess we're the new maintainers until he reappears. Um, so we're going to declare some variables. We're going to declare our video capture as a separate pointer. And we're going to bring create a pointer to an mjpeg.stream, which is where we're going to do the streaming from. So same pattern as before in our main function. Open the video capture device. But this time, we're going to create a new MJPEG stream, and we're going to call a Go routine to start the capturing. Then we're going to say, in order to handle the root of our HTTP server, it's going to be served up by the stream, and then just start listening and serving. So then our capture Go routine does what we saw before in our main routine, right? So we create a new map to put it into. We read it into the webcam. We take that and encode it into JPEG format, and then we just update the stream's JPEG with that buffer. So if the demo gods continue to favor me today, which might happen, so we go run demo and JPEG streamer main. We're going to pass in two parameters. The first one is the camera ID. The second one is the IP address and port that we'd like to serve on. So let's just use 8080 for sentimental reasons. Oh. Forgot I have to actually enter in the, oh, there we go. Localhost 8080, and there I am. In web streaming video, and if we had Wi-Fi and everyone could get to it, you could go all on your phones, but we really don't have time for that today, so. All right. So that's a real problem in the real world that is incredibly annoying. And you're like, can you stream this on the internet? You're like, uh, I don't think so. And you start doing a Google search, and you're like, oh, <laughs> make it stop. Or make it start, actually. Make it start. So um, all right. So now uh, object classification. So object classification means being able to figure out not just a specific face that we've already memorized, but being able to identify classes of objects, dogs, cats, pillows tin cans, bicycles, et cetera. And we're going to use TensorFlow and a drone. Yeah. We're going to use the uh, DJI Tello drone. So the DJI Tello is a brand new drone from DJI, the awesome Chinese drone company. And uh, let's go and take a quick look at it just because I mean, it's really cool. So go run, demo, hello just because that way I can use the same stuff as I was using before. So here's the Tello. It's very small, because that's all they'll let me travel with anymore. <laughs> so it's, um, it's got a 14-core Intel processor built in that has an Intel Movidius neural compute chip, which is what's known as a VPU, or a visual processing unit, or video processing unit. It's silicon that's specifically optimized to do deep neural network calculations very quickly and at very low power utilization, since when you're flying a drone, you know, power is pretty important. You never have enough of it. Just nothing lasts anymore, <laughs> especially not batteries. All right, so if we go over here, so we're going to use TensorFlow. So I bet my, it's going to fall asleep before I start. So TensorFlow is a, deep, a machine learning mathematical. Tensors are mathematical operations. Flow-based programming is when you take the outputs of one operation and you put it into the inputs of another. And if you want to know a lot about this, the talk after mine, Natalie is going to go into a deep dive into TensorFlow so uh, she can correct all the errors that I give you now. Thank you, by the way. So a deep neural network, the difference between that and just a neural network is that the, it has hidden nodes. We have inputs, and they go through these hidden nodes to then be analyzed into their outputs. And the typical architecture that we're gonna, that's used in this demonstration is what's known as the inception v3 architecture, where actually the nodes are themselves neural networks and so on, uh, you know, like the movie. And it's been trained on an open source data set of images known as ImageNet to be able to do general purpose classification. 
Or you could just call the GusEV.net class in order to. It's up to you. It's up to you. I heard you're not supposed to use frameworks, but, um, <laughs> but I, I do a lot of stuff you're not supposed to do. So, so we don't have time to go over all this code. Um, but so we're going to use the DJI Tele. Or, oh, we're using GoBot to fly the drone, and then we're going to use GoCV to do the analysis of the video. They play together very nicely. So we're going to open our Tello, our joystick. I'm going to use my uh, PS3 clone controller because I drop these, and these are really inexpensive clones. We're going to use the OpenCV support that's built into GoCV, or sorry, into GoBot, and then we're going to use GoCV to do a bit more tricky stuff. So we have our values for the joystick. So we're going to open um, our model based on what parameter we pass in. We have different models uh, that are supported. Um, so we're going to just call one or use one that's already been trained with the image data. We have a description file. That way we can actually display them. We're going to open our joystick. We're going to open our Tello drone and our OpenCV video driver. So now here is the part where we actually load the TensorFlow model. In. Now, we're not actually using TensorFlow directly. What we're doing is we're taking a model that's been trained using TensorFlow, and then we're loading it into OpenCV by way of GoCV. So in other words, we're using the built-in support in OpenCV for loading these models. We're not actually calling TensorFlow itself. So then we are going to use FFmpeg. The video that comes from the Tello drone is uh, H.264 encoded. Uh, which is a common streaming format, but it has a couple of extra bytes, so we can't just point it to a normal video streaming software. We have to do a little tiny bit of bit massage first. And so we're going to run this as an exec.command, and then we're going to pipe the video that we're pulling from the drone into it, and then we're going to take that video and pipe it back out to put it into GoCV. So the Go function that we're going to call is we're going to actually pull in that data from the UDP port, we're going to create a new map right from the bytes. That way, we don't have to copy the data. It's much more efficient this way, because sometimes these images are very large. Then we're going to convert that into the two, uh, it's actually 224 by 224. Shoot, I better check that, because that would be really embarrassing. Well, it's all right. Good enough. Um, I'm pretty sure the code is right. Well, we'll see. Um, so we take that, and we convert it into the blob format that we need to pass it into the TensorFlow model. We say that the input is going to be the input node. Where output is going to be the softmax2 node, which is going to contain a mat with all of the different vectors that correspond to the different classification categories. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Then we're going to find the most probable, because we don't care about all 1,000 different categories. We only care about the most likely of the image of the thing that's being held up. By the way, if you have any common objects in the front row, like common objects, bottles, cans, glasses, microphones, pretty much anything in that list of 1,000. So we're then going to display that in the image. We're going to close everything up and then keep going. And so we're going to, the, how do you fly the drone again? Let's see, take off with triangle and land with X. OK, that should be good. That's all we need to know, right? Oh, hmm. uh -oh it's warmed up. I might need my spare battery. It'll be fine. It'll all be fine. It's a Wi-Fi access point of its own, so it has to, all right, good. Disconnect. Reconnect. Let's see if the demo gods continue to favor me or not. It should be fun. We connected to the Tello. Flash photography is OK, but you might scare the ghosts. All right, so go run, demo, what's it called again? Oh, yeah, tensor drone. Let's see, it's got a couple parameters. I can't remember what they are, though. Oh, hmm. Let's see. I'm going to have to do. It's, I'm using DEP. And, uh, oh, I know what I got to do. Oh, wait. Mm, no, that won't work. Hmm. Delete the vendor directory? Yeah. I don't have a vendor directory in this project. Oh, I knew I should have. I know. I, I discussed this actually um, at some length. 
um, with Sam over many beers, and he's like, pull request it. And I'm like, yeah, I'll get to it, I swear. Um, I know what I can do. I can just switch to a different version of Go. That'll totally work. I think one line three might run. I don't know. No. Oh. Yeah, well, I guess we'll find out. It has to compile the code now this time because it's using an older version. This is all just to get it to tell me what I'm missing. All right, I think it's a go. I believe it's a, a model file. Let's see. No. Oh, I remember I downloaded it. That's right. Uh, hmm, somewhere in here. <laughs> I think it's like a P, starts with a P. I don't know. Here, let me see if it's in my bash history. That's what always saves me. Hopefully. Somewhere. Uh, uh, please. Save me. Oh, no, it's not. It's all these other things. Some, you know, okay, let's see. Yeah, I guess we could look at the code again and see which of the two things we need to put in. Not, that's just a little too, I mean, so, so sad. <clears throat> TensorFlow main. Hopefully the drone didn't fall asleep while I was doing all this. No, it's still there. And I think it's, uh, let's see, BBLC cafe model, I believe. Oh, no, that's the cafe model. No, let's see, what's the name of the model? It's in here somewhere. I probably should have put it somewhere more easily accessible, but you know, <laughs> that also would have been like, I know, I know since that words is my words file, but uh, I can't remember. <laughs> when did you? <laughs> I, I prefer not to wear shoes typically. Where is that? Oh, yeah, that's it. And then the other one, <laughs> that's a very sad file. <laughs> oh, and the drone did fall asleep. I knew that was going to happen. That's okay. We can wake it back up. That was somewhat of an unusual circumstance. I usually have a bash history that extends far back into the ancient past. That's a very unusual situation. Okay, now we're connected. And then let's see, what was the name of the file for the <laughs> for the words? The words file. We need the words or else it won't know how to. I think it's uh, it might be image mat comp grab label strings. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's the one for cafe though. Because I was doing this exact same one with cafe and then I switched to TensorFlow because of the hipster thing. Oh, so um, so what was it again? The other the word, word, I just saw it a second ago. ImageNet, there we go. Yeah, that's it. Ah, figures. <laughs> we gotta do that again? Oh God, how embarrassing. This is how you know it's real though. So it's the one that, I know, but I gotta, I, yeah, that's right, take it, have some water, have a beer, it'll be fine. Uh, then it, it was, there we go. All right, so now if the, everything is actually working now, we'll see what happens. It's gotta compile. That's where Go 1.10 is so great with its, uh, no, it's the same problem. So this version of Go doesn't have it either, but at least now we, uh, maybe it's 1.4, 194. One of these will work. Oh, no, okay, maybe it's 195. I had one of these working. No, that's not it. All right. It's just different types of blocks. Oh, well, if we're going to do that, let's go back to the original version. Go must import in, has a vendor version of that, and you're importing that into one line. I believe you. 
Oh, that'll, I don't have internet access. I'm connected to a drone. <laughs> it's okay. We can fix this. Uh, let's see. From GoBot? Yeah, from GoBot. And then just delete vendor. It won't work any less than it is right now. So there's that. Now we got to wake the drone up again. <laughs> By the time it compiles, it will probably reconnect to the Wi-Fi. Ah, OK, so now we're almost there. We're so close. Is it? OK, it's ready. We're so close. But it's not seeing the, oh, there, there's my SSID. All right. Oh, so close. Oh, wait, no, let's just try again. This time it'll work probably. Yeah. So it should, OK, there we go. Hi, everybody. The lights are a little dim. Let's see if we can recognize the cameraman. Unknown. He's very unknown. <laughs> Jellyfish. Shower curtain. Water bottle. Oh, it's, uh, uh, the lights are kind of dim. This is not the best type of scenario, possibly. For this type of flying? Uh oh. The controller came out. This is going to be a dramatic ending. Okay, this is where um, my small unmanned aerial systems license comes in handy. <laughs> I mean, I could have just walked around with it, but that would have taken all the fun out of it. It's, it says oxygen mask. That seems appropriate. You know, I'll put in some failover for the joystick yeah, next time. All right. So that, my friends, is GoCV. And I thank you.